per gli speaker, primo, Cesar che tu arriverai non superare questa linea se non finite nella linea, lui è Cesar Hidalgo intanto vieni qua con me, viene assistant professor all'MIT e mi dicevi anche e faculty associate at Harvard University faculty associate at Harvard University 31 anni, allora questa è la nostra la vostra linea bianca, never cross the line the, okay. the white line, otherwise you go in the dark e Perfetto. ci chiedevano da Twitter perché non, uh, non mandiamo su uno degli schermi il, il feed di Twitter, forse si può fare? Che dite, si può fare? Magari mandare i sì, messaggi di Twitter su uno degli schermi in diretta, possibile, ce lo chiedevano? Magari è possibile farlo? Arrivano molte domande, tra l'altro anche Alan Mislov ha detto se avete domande per lui gliele potete fare, gliele potete fare anche prima della tavola rotonda che tra pochissimo faremo con i nostri primi tre ospiti. Allora parliamo dell'impatto dei dati sull'economia e sulla ricchezza delle nazioni, che è un titolo che mi ricorda quello che studiava all'università, Cesare Hidalgo. Molto grazie. Ciao. Okay, so um, I would also like to thank the organizers and to thank Alessandro for putting me in contact and bringing me to Turin. Actually, part of my family comes from Turin from a long time ago, so it's, it's, it's very nice for me to be here. And today I'm going to be talking about a little bit different than the previous talks. I'm going to be talking about actually how we can use data to understand our economies in a different way and to take some problems that they, they look mysterious and show that actually when you look at the data from a different perspective, they become a little bit clearer. So I'm going to start telling you a story about two countries. Let's see. Okay. So these two countries are Korea and Peru. And this story starts back in 1970. So back in 1970, Korea had an income of $3,300. Peru had an income of $6,000 per capita per annum. And, you know, so we could say at that time that Peru was twice richer than Korea. That would be one way of saying it. Yeah? Now we would ask ourselves, well, why is Peru twice richer than Korea? You know? And we would say, well, you know, maybe there are certain things that Peruvians have that allows them to be more productive. You know? So let's look at some of those things. So we we'll look at actually you know, the physical capital per worker of Peru will find that it's four times larger than that of Korea. Okay? Now, if we would look at the land per worker of Peru, we would find that actually, you know, Peru has 2.5 times the amount of land. You know, so Peruvians have more capital, more machines to work with, they have more land to work with, and if we look at the education measured in years of schooling, this clicker is, is not very responsive. Um, we find that actually both countries had less than five years of schooling per, for each of their, of their workers. So they were, uh, both countries were very poorly educated and there wasn't that much of a difference. Now, you know, if we go forward, we know that actually the world is not like that anymore. And if we go into the future, we find that actually now Korea is four times richer than Peru. So Peru was twice richer than Korea, and now Korea is four times richer than Peru. And if we look at you know, the physical capital per worker, now we find that Korea has four times the physical capital per worker. If we look at land, well, Peru hasn't gotten any smaller, so they're still ahead on the amount of land per worker. And if we look at the amount of education, we find that Korea now has a little bit more of an advantage. Both countries have got much more educated since the 1970s. You know, uh, but, you know, there is, there is a small difference when it comes to years of schooling. And when you see that, you know, and everyone that sees this type of stories, they're going to ask themselves, well, you know, they're going to ask themselves, you know, what the helicopter? <laughs> you know, you're going to ask yourselves, how did Peru went from half the per capita income how the, sorry, how Korea went from half the per capita income of Peru to four times Peru's income. Okay? So that's kind of like the puzzle. That's kind of like a traditional question that you have, you know, like Latin America and East Asia, or now, you know, East Asia and Europe has become a little bit more popular re in recent years. You know? And my answer is that actually, you know, this looks like a puzzle because we're taking a description of the world in which we think that the world is made of earth, wind, you know, water and fire, or like my economist friends like to say, you know, that the world is made of land, labor, capital, and human capital. Okay? So what I'm going to do 
is I'm going to build a different description of the world, and then after I have built this different way of describing the world, I'm going to show you how this different way of describing the world can be used to explain this type of development puzzles. Okay? So let's start building this description. Uh, I'm a scientist, and you know what scientists do is we're in a building that is very similar to that of engineers and miners, we're in the business of building tunnels. Okay? So when you build a tunnel, on one side you know, of the tunnel, you're going to have you know, observation, and on the other side, you're going to have the theory. And your goal is to build a tunnel between the two. Okay? You want to build a tunnel because if you start digging just from the observation side, and you don't have a theory to interpret that observations, then you're going to end up in a deep, dark hole. Yeah? You're not going to be able to see anything because you're not going to be able to interpret your results. If you just have theory and you have no observation, you're not going to be able to make a connection with the real world. But the good thing about tunnels is that you can dig them from both ends. You can start you know, from one end or from the other end. So to dig this tunnel, I'm going to start first from the observation. And I want to just show very four, very simple and lame facts that I'm going to use actually to be able to connect the theory and the data later on. So instead of looking at earth, water, wind, and fire, I'm going to look at networks instead. And here is a very bad and coarse visualization of, of the data sets that we're going to be using. In this data, what we use is we have countries. In that case, or here we have municipalities. And we have industries or products. So the only thing that you need to remember from this slide is that we have vast amounts of data on who makes what, OK? So you know which country makes what product. And if you see from that, uh, from that slide there, you're going to see that actually you know, there is like around a million numbers that we're looking at here. You, know, you have like 200 countries, 5,000 products. That's roughly like a million data points that we're going to try to understand them and look at their dynamics of who makes what. Okay? So in order to be able to, to create a theory that allows us to explain who makes what, and why that matters, we need to have some estalized facts, some way of reducing this large amount of data into some simple observations that we can use to later anchor the theory and the data. You know? So the first observation that we come up with is the following. Is we can take this data, and we can take all the countries, and we can sort them. And on the top row, you have the country that is the most diverse, the one that exports the largest variety of products. On the bottom, we're going to put the countries that export fewest products. Okay? And now on the left, I'm going to put the most ubiquitous product. That's the product that is exported by most countries. On the right, I'm going to put the less ubiquitous products. That is the product that is exported by fewer countries. And what you see is that when I do that, this matrix becomes sort of triangular. There's a lot of action here, and there's nothing going on there. What this means is that, you know, the countries that make few things tend to make things that everyone else makes, yeah? very ubiquitous things. Now, the products that are made by few countries are only made by the countries that already make everything. Yeah? So we can formalize, actually, this stylized fact. And we can say, well, you know, here I can take the diversity of countries. Here I can take the, the average ubiquity of their products. And I find that there's this negative relationship. So what I see here is, for instance, here you have Germany, the United States, Austria, Italy, and Great Britain. And those are countries that in this classification, they would be exporting between 300 and 400 products. And those products are exported by roughly you know, 15 other countries. While Western Samoa and Malawi are countries that export you know, like maybe 20 or 30 products that are exported by 30 or so other countries, by much larger number of countries. You know, how do we know that this is not just an artifact of living in a very heterogeneous world in which there are some countries that export lots of things, some countries that export few things, some products that are very common and some products that are very rare? What we can actually do is we can take this network and we can create one in which each country exports exactly the same number of products and in which each product is exported exactly by the same number of countries. And we can shuffle everything that we can in between. And when we do that, what we get is actually that that relationship completely disappears. So this is a fact that is not simply saying that there are some countries that are very diverse or not, or that are products that are very ubiquitous or not, but that there is some connection between these two variables that is non-trivial. So that's one fact. We have no idea what it means. 
Okay, because we have no theory yet. We have no idea what it means, but that's a fact. You know, so that's something that we're going to have to reproduce later. Let me put two other facts. These are very lame and very boring, but they're going to be useful. <laughs> this next fact is just I'm going to look at the distribution of ubiquities and the distribution of diversities. No, so that's the probability that a product is exported by X countries. And that's the probability that a country would export X products. And the only thing that I'm going to say is that these distributions are not normal, are not just Gaussian distributions. The Gaussian would be the blue line there, which is always the worst fit. Okay? So I'm going to say this. I cannot reproduce them with a trivial distribution. I need a model that gives me a distribution that is a little bit more sophisticated than a normal. And I'm not going to say anything more than that at this point. And the last fact that I'm going to take is I'm going to look at the probability that two products are co-exported. Yeah? There is a chance that if you export mangoes, you will also export bananas. Or the fact that if you export mangoes, you will also export motorcycles. So I can take all of those probabilities, all of those probabilities that two products are exported in tandem. And what I can do is I can get that distribution. And I find also that here, the normal distribution is not a good fit. Actually, the best fit with the two parameters appears to be the Weibull distribution. So now I have the observation, I have the four lame facts, and I'm in a deep dark hole. Yeah? I have like four facts, I don't know what they mean. You know? So I have to start digging on the theory side to try to understand you know, what these facts mean and, and what they imply for the world. So the model that I'm going to use is a little bit different. I'm not going to think that the world is made of earth, water, wind, and fire. I'm going to think that actually you know, the products of the world and the services of the world and the industries of the world result from a large combination of things, like Lego pieces. So in this world, products are not combinations of the same things. They're combinations of different things. Yeah? Some products, for example, are very complex, requires many things to be made. You know? These are non-tradable things. You know? And some products require few things. Some products can require rare things. You know? Remember that in an earth, water, wind, and fire description of the world, all products are combinations of the same thing. They all have to be combinations of capital, labor, land, and human capital. Yeah? But in here, they can be combinations of different things. And countries are buckets of Legos. Okay? And the world that we're observing is simply a world that tells us which country can make what product. So we have four facts about that. Okay? And the theory is going to be super simple. I'm going to say you know, that a country can make a product if and only if it has all the Lego pieces that that product requires. Yeah? So you can also think if you don't like the Lego analogy, maybe there's some people that like playing Scrabble, you know, Scrabble, the, the game with words. You can think that, for example, a product is like a word. So it's the word car. So to build the word car, you need the C, the A, and the R. But if you have the C and the A, and if you also get the T, you could build the word cat. Yeah? So they're kind of like these interchangeable tiles. But if you're missing the R, you cannot make the word car, or the word rat, or any of those words. Yeah? You need every piece to make that product. Yeah? So it's very simple. So now, in order to be able to connect the theory and the data, I'm going to introduce some very simple assumptions. Okay? This is the only technical part that we're going to have. I'm going to say that a country has one of these Lego pieces with probability R. I'm going to say that it's the same for all countries. I'm going to say that a product requires one of these Lego pieces with probability Q, which is the same for all products. Okay? So we make the, the, the system much simple. And then we see if the predictions that the system makes match the data that we have. So this is the first fact that I showed. Remember that I told you that countries that are more diversified tend to be products that are made by fewer other countries, where the red dots you know, are actually the data. And the blue line is the prediction from this theory. So we see that actually there's a pretty good match, meaning that you know, the theory appears to reproduce something about the data. The next thing I'm going to look at is the probability that two products are co-exported. Yeah? So here the red is the data, the blue is the theory, and as you can see, they match like a glove. Yeah? They match very, very tight match. Yeah? Now, with these two observations, I actually have run out of three parameters to calibrate the model. So anything that I get out of you know, next is going to be for free, you know, because already I have nothing left to adjust. The next thing that I'm going to look at was this other very boring fact. What was the probability that a product is exported by a certain number of countries, the distribution of ubiquities. And there you see the red 
you know, is the, the data, the blue is the theory, and also I have a good match. You know? So now I have like three facts that actually my theory is able to account for. So I'm getting closer to find a theory that actually is able to tell me something about the structure of the network of who makes what. And I have one more fact to go. What is the distribution of diversifications? And here the red is the data, the blue is the theory. And the question is, how did we do here? Like as, as I think uh, Wolfgang Pauli once said about Dirac, uh, this is not even wrong, okay? <laughs> This is not even wrong. It doesn't, like that doesn't even match, yeah? You see, and why it doesn't match? Because in our theory, all countries sort of make a similar number of products, but in the world, there are some countries that make few things and countries that make lots of things, you know? And that is something that the theory that we just introduced or the model that we just introduced is not able to reproduce. So I think this is kind of cool because, you know, we got that wrong, we got three out of four, you know, so we have a model that actually is starting to approximate the world, but we found a time in which it doesn't approximate the world. So the question is, why? Now we start to learn something. You know, anybody has a clue why, you know, within, you know, the model, within the, the assumptions of the model, the model would not reproduce this last fact? So I'll, I'll give it away. <laughs> So we, we introduce a very, very strong simplifying assumption. We assume that the probability of finding one of these capabilities or Lego pieces in Malawi or finding it in Netherlands are the same. That's not true. You know, the world has to be a little bit more heterogeneous than that, probably. You know? So what we can do is we can relax that assumption. We can give every country its individual probability. And when we do that, actually, we overfit the data, but we show that within the space of these matrices, we can actually have, you know, a world in which we reproduce all of these four facts. Mm -hmm. So now we have four out of four. So we were able to dig the tunnel. Okay? We have the facts, we have the theory, and we know that they match. Now I have to show you why should you care. Because so facts, it looks like, a, like an academic exercise, doesn't it? You know? So why should you care? So I'm going to show you a, 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 a set of things of why should you care. You know? The first thing, it looks a little bit abstract, but actually it's very insightful. So in this chart, what I have is on the x-axis, you know, I have actually the number of capabilities or Lego pieces that a country would have, and on the y-axis is the number of products that it would make. So that point on the 1, 1, you know, we get for free. Because if you have all capabilities, you can make all products. If you have all letters of the alphabet, you can make all words. Yeah? But you see that there's a variety of lines here. It's a lot of lines, you know? What these lines represent are different instantiations of the model. They're different worlds. On the top is the Q equals zero world. That means that products are easy to make. So think of a world in which there are 100 capabilities and products require two or three. What happens if you have 10 and you go from 10 to 11? Well, if products require only two things to be made and you have 10 things, you know, maybe when you get a new one, in combination with some of the 10 that you have, translates into something. So what you find is that in this Q equals zero, in this world in which making products is simple, like the lines are kind of straight, you know? If you have few capabilities, or if you have many capabilities, you know, you get an equal return to accumulating one more. But now what happens in that same world in which you have 100 capabilities, but now creating a product requires 30? Now, what happens if you have 10 capabilities? How many products can you make? Zero. Yeah? And what happens if you go from 10 to 15? It's a big effort going from 10 to 15, but still you get nothing. You go from 10 to 20, you get nothing. So there you get zero return when you have few capabilities in that world. So in the world in which products are complex, you get zero return when you have few capabilities, and you get a large return when you have many, because when you have 80 or 90 percent of all capabilities and products require 30 or 40, well, any new capability that comes along is going to combine with the ones that you have and it's going to translate into a new product. Yeah? So the question is, which world do we live in? Do we live in the Q equals zero world or the Q going to one world? And actually, you know, 
we live in this Q equal to one world in which there are traps, in which countries that have, you know, like a little diversity on their capability endowment, they would be trapped in their development process. Now what also this slide tells us, which I think is, is very insightful, is that it tells us that divergence, cross-country divergence in income, is a phenomena that is a consequence of a world in which complexity has increased. Yeah? So if you go back many, many, many years to the time you know, of the caveman, well, complexity was very little. You know, all products were simple. And in that world, you know, there was no possibility of having differences in income. You know, this difference in income are a consequence of a world that became more complex, probably during the Industrial Revolution. And if you go back even to the time of Alan Smith, 1776, the Wealth of Nations was published, the difference in income between the richest and poor countries was a factor of four. Now it's like around a factor of 50. So it's telling us that as the world becomes more complex, actually divergence is something that we should expect. Okay. So what about Korea and Peru? I started telling you a story about Korea and Peru, and now we're going to start going back because we have a different way of looking at the world, and we can start looking at Korea and Peru with different eyes. You know? So now we go back to 1970. Now we know that countries that are more diversified you know, are countries that actually you know, have more capabilities, have more Legos. You know, the number of products that you make is related to the number of capabilities that you have. And we also know that countries you know, that make products that are less ubiquitous also have more Legos. And if we look at that, we find that Korea had a productive structure that was more sophisticated than that on Peru in 1970. And it's still the same. The thing is, we can actually do a little bit better than that. We can do better than just looking at diversity and ubiquity to be able you know, to infer how sophisticated the productive structure of each one of these countries is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the reverse problem. Before we had actually a, the a theory that went from here to there, you know, we have observations there, and we use these observations in this part of this conceptual space to connect, you know, the theory and the data. Now what I'm gonna do, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that network and I'm gonna sort of like take the square root of it. I'm gonna factorize it into these two other bipartite networks. And I'm gonna use that to measure the number of capabilities that each country has. Yeah. So now this is something that should be fairly simple because you guys understand the theory. If you have more capabilities, it's easier for you to make more products, yeah? because you have the combinations that it takes. If you have few capabilities, it's hard for you to make lots of products, because you're missing many of those capabilities. Yeah? So the first approximation to the number of capabilities that you're going to have, or Lego pieces, is the number of products that you make. You know? Countries that are more diverse, you should expect that they have more capabilities. But you need a way to have tiebreakers here. You know? So what happens now? if you have two countries that export exactly the same number of products, but one is making all the difficult stuff and that one is making all the easy stuff, who should you give more credit to? The one that makes the difficult things or the one that makes the easy things? If you make the difficult things, I would give them more credit. How do you know who's making the difficult stuff? Well, difficult things require many capabilities. So those things are made in fewer countries. So now I can have our second criteria, I can say, well, how diverse the country is and how many countries make what you make. And then I can have a third criteria. I can say, well, how many products you make, how many countries make what you make, and the countries that make what you make, how diversified they are. Because you have two countries that are equal in the first two dimensions, I can say, well, you know, if you're making things that are made by other countries that are diverse and complex, I'm going to give you more credit as well. So when you do that, you start perfecting these measures. Why? Because we have actually a theory that tells us you know, how the number of capabilities that a country has is connected to the structure of the network that connects it to the products that it makes. Okay? So that allows us to create a ranking for both countries and products. We can do the same thing for products. And this is kind of like what comes out of this ranking, just to give you an idea. So on the top table, we have the products that are determined to be more sophisticated. And remember that this is just a matrix of who makes what. It's a matrix of zeros and ones. We don't know which country is whom or which product is what. And on the top, for example, the most sophisticated product comes out to be machines and applies for specialized industries, instruments and appliances, and appliances for physical or chemical analysis, appliances based on the use of x-rays, lubricating petrol oils, other machine tools for working metal or metal carbide. Now, the least complex products in the world, 
Remember that we just have data ones and zeros, who makes what. We don't know what these things are, you know. But what comes out is crude oil as the least sophisticated product in the world. Then you have tin ores, you know, and ore is like a completely raw form of mineral. You know, cotton, not card or combs, or this is completely unworked cotton. Okay, cocoa beans and sesame seeds. The most complex countries in the world come out to be Japan, Germany, Switzerland, and Sweden. Okay? So now we have sort of like a measure, and the measure from, from the previous slide, you can say that it kind of like it sort of makes sense. But there's a lot of things that make sense, but that doesn't mean that they're true. You know, religion makes a lot of sense sometimes, you know, but you know, that doesn't make it you know, a scientific explanation of the world. So what you want something is not that it simply makes sense, but also that make out of sample predictions, that makes predictions about aspects of the world that were not in the original data that you used to construct that model. So what we're going to look at here now is we have, you know, our measure of complexity and a more standard measure of development, which is GDP per capita. GDP is a measure that was introduced, as you all know probably, in the 1930s by Salomon Kuznets in response, you know, to the financial crisis of the time. So the government of the United States, you know, actually the Department of Commerce created a commission so they would be able to actually have a measure that allowed them to see where the economy was expanding or contracting, where it was, you know, where they're going in the right direction. And that's where GDP was started. You know, so it's also a theory, you know, that has been implemented in a way of collecting large amounts of data. And this is our theory, this is our measure of complexity. And if you're in the zero, you would be in the average of the world, you would be one, you would be one standard deviation to the right of the average, two, two standard deviations, and so forth. Now, uh, I have three dots there that I have highlighted. The big blue dot, that's Singapore. The big red dot is Chile. And the big green dot is Pakistan. I highlighted those dots because these are three countries that exported exactly the same number of products. But you see that when I consider not only the number of products, but I consider, well, how ubiquitous those products are how diversified the countries that make those products are, and so forth, Singapore groups with the rich countries, and Pakistan groups with the poor countries. Now you see that there's a decent correlation between these two. Huh? You know, countries that we say that are more complex tend to be richer. Countries that we say that are a little complex tend to be poorer. But there's also countries that do not satisfy this relationship. So what does this mean? You know, like a line here, you know, would be a line in which you are equal in complexity. Yeah? But a horizontal line, you would be equal in income. Yeah? So what does it mean to be down here, below the gray line, below the regression line? Well, a country like India, China, Ukraine, is a country that has what it takes, from the point of view of their industrial structure, to do the things that are made in Argentina, Uruguay, Greece, New Zealand. But it's making 10 times less. It's making one-tenth of the income. So who should you expect to grow? If I'm able to do your job, but I charge one-tenth of the salary, well, my salary should go up. You know? But it's not any country that is poor, because here you have Malawi, Sudan, which are countries you know, that have extremely low incomes, but given what they make, they shouldn't be any richer. You know? So how can we test for this? Well, we can take the distance between you know, the dot and the line, you know, and we can see if that predicts growth in the future. And actually, it does. It predicts growth extremely well. So countries tend to converge to a level of income that is determined by the complexity of their economy. And we can measure the complexity of their economy by looking at the structure of the network of who makes what. Yeah? So that's, that's one reason why these things matter. No? So actually, we just published all of these results. We summarized like, this area of research in this book, you know, uh, The Atlas of Economic Complexity. And you can download that book for free at atlas.media.mit.edu. And you can explore like millions of interactive visualizations you know, that I would highly encourage you to visit. Then you can see Italy, and then you can see what Italy trades with China, what they sell to China, what they buy from China, how it has changed in time, you know, and so forth. You, know? you can also look at the level of industries. You can look at the car industry, or you can look at the spark plug industry, or whatnot. But one thing that we show in the Atlas is that, well, you know, we're not the first ones to come up with a measure of the level of development of a country. Yeah? There's a lot of people, actually, that have been coming with theories and measures of why these things matter. You know? One line of thought is, for example, that governance matters. You know? 
Now here, for example, very recently there was a change of, of, of government and I had the feeling that some people were not very happy with the previous person that was in charge. But maybe it's just, just a feeling that I have. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so here, you know, we take now like a, a large regression, you know, for those that are familiar with, you know, and actually we look at the marginal contribution of different variables to explain future growth, you know? So the red bar on the top there is the marginal the contribution of complexity in a regression in which we include all of the World Bank's governance indicators. And when we do that, complexity predicts 15% of the variance of future income. All institutional variables together actually predict like around 2%. And if you take them separately, they're not even statistically significant. So if we look at political stability, voice and accountability, rule of law, regulatory quality, government effectiveness, or control of corruption, at least the measures that we have for them are not predictive of future economic growth once we take the productive structure of countries into account. We do the same with education. Education is very popular in Chile, where huge rise of education all year. And now we find actually that our marginal contribution to future growth is like around 12% in that case. And if we put all education variables together, we go around 3%, and we put them separately. Actually, they don't make that much of a difference. This is where using variables like a school enrollment, but actually we also try this using a standardized test like PISA, you know, and in those tests also we don't find that much of a difference. And now finally, you know, because these are two things that matter, but they were not constructed specifically you know, to predict growth. But the World Economic Forum actually constructs a report on competitiveness, the Global Competitiveness Index. So the Global Competitiveness Index is constructed because they say that competitiveness is what actually you know, helps countries grow. Okay? So it's constructed actually to predict this variable. But when we look at that, you know, this is how good we do, and this is how well they do. You know, so we do like, like a 17 18%. They do like 2.5% in predicting 12-year growth. No? So now every year, like around October, you're going to go to a newspaper and you're going to see the news and you're going to say, you know, your country changed, you know, two points or went up or down, like two points in the ranking of competitiveness of the World Economics Forum. Yeah? You've seen those news. Yeah? Exactly. So that news can be rephrased. You know, in the future you could have a news that says, you know, ranking has a statistically insignificant change in ranking, does that not predict anything? You know? <laughs> that would be a more accurate description of actually what, what, what the news would be about. Yeah? Two more minutes. Two more minutes. OK, perfect. So we go back to Korea and Peru. You know? And when we look now at Korea and Peru in these measures of complexity, this is the ranking. OK? And you see that Korea was always more sophisticated than Peru when it comes to complexity. It was always higher on the ranking. This goes from 1964 to 2005. You know? So here, there's no surprise either. But I think that now you have one final question, which is the one that I'm going to use to end the presentation, which is, well, where do you get these Lego pieces? You know? Because in the previous theory, like in the previous like, aggregate theory of Smith and Marx and neoclassical theory, basically they're all the same stream of thought. You know, you have kind of like this, this patty. Oh, OK. You have this putty type of substance. You know, you have like this. This plastic in this, you know, that is capital, and you can use it for everything. But here we find out that if you want to make predictions about the world, if you want to have a theory that actually explains the development of countries, you cannot assume that it is made of earth, water, wind, and fire. You need a much more disaggregate view, and you need to know where these capabilities come from. You know? And the problem is that you cannot make a product when you're missing the capabilities, but you have no incentive to accumulate the capabilities when you're missing the industries that require them. You know? So the question is, how does the world deal with this? You know? And the way that the world deals with this is by moving to products that are close by in some way. You know? So imagine that I'm playing a Scrabble and I, I have C, A, and R, and I can do the word car. Well, one word that would be close for me to make would be the word cat or the word rat. You know? You know? There are other three-letter words, for example, who, from which I would be very far. You know? So now, you know, how can we measure this? We measure this by looking at countries and products, and we don't know what these capabilities are, but we're going to say that if bananas and mangoes tend to be co-exported, they're more likely to require some of the same Lego pieces. 
So we project this into the world of products or product space. Okay? And this is the map of the product space. Okay? So here, each dot represents an industry, and links connect industries that tend to be co-exporters. Okay? So for example, the green dots there, all of the green dots there in that cluster, those are garments. Products there would be things like you know, trousers, or things like you know, shirts, or things you know, like socks, footwear. You know? The red are construction material. The blue is machinery. The purple are chemicals. The light blue there is electronics, and so forth. You know, the yellow one is cereals. So you see that there's a heterogeneous structure. There are parts that are connected. There are parts that are sparse. You know, and our prediction was that countries jump from the products that they do to us that are close by in this space. So what about Korea and Peru? Let's use them to illustrate the example. You know? So this is 1974. And here, the black squares, you see that some nodes now have black squares around them? Those are the products that Korea was exporting in 1974. So you see that they do things on the green cluster up there, and some things here on the blue cluster down here, 1974. Also, some things on the dark green cluster that is a little bit to the right there. You know, unfortunately, there's no laser pointer to, to be able to, to show it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to start passing this movie little by little, and you're going to see how the practice structure of Korea changes. You know? So we go from 1974 to 1984, and you see that now everything that is garments there you know, has been conquered. And if I go back to 1974, you see that you have a lot of action here in electronics, and there's a few things that are close by. And you're going to see that quickly, they're going to start moving in that direction, 1984, 1994, and they're able to take all over this. Now, there is a little bit more action going also here in the machinery cluster. And you see that actually they keep on developing there by 2004, by 2009. Actually, they, they're a powerhouse in electronics, in their chemicals, and now machinery. So they were moving into products you know, that were adjacent you know, to the ones that they do in the product space. They were relatively well located. Now, this is Peru in 1984. You know? We are running out of time. OK, yeah. So it's the same slice for Korea, but for Peru. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, so you know what is coming. <laughs> yeah. So now, you, know, you see that Peru actually has very few black squares, and they're very peripheral. No? There are very few things going on. And if I go forward, actually, Peru, these start changing. For example, if you see up there, they have like on the light blue cluster on the top left, they have that's fishing. And they keep on you know, advancing in fishing, and they're able to perform all of the fishing things. They start doing a little things on garments. And by the year 2004 and 2009, they have jumped to products that were close by in the product space, but they started in a much worse off location, and they were much less dynamic than Korea. So now, to conclude, I would just say that when you ask about Korea and Peru, wasn't it fairly obvious? Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.